great comments about sexuality, and I'll talk about those a little bit more um, today. Also, I want to say, I don't know if you know yet, but you are really in a special program. You're going to have opportunities that other people on campus don't have, and I really urge you to take full advantage of those because it will just make your whole education so much richer. All right. So. I have something actually for Scott, and it's going to end up with one of you. This is a greater than 1800 page book called Guide to Getting It On. I don't know if any of you have it or have heard of it. It's got about a 500 word glossary in it, beginning with aardvarking and ending with yif. And it is very explicit and straightforward. It also comes with a do not disturb sign for your door. <laughs> And I'm giving this to Scott and the faculty, and the, you guys can decide how and who will get the book. Okay, you're welcome. I'll give it to Scott. <laughs> it's a great book. I'm not kidding. It's a really great book. Okay, so are you ready to talk about sex? Yeah, listen to that. <laughs> I know, what would an old lady know about it? <laughs> you don't want to talk with an old lady about it, right? So I'm going to argue today that sex is not a private thing, that we really need to be talking about it in open and informed ways, because what's going on now really isn't working, and I'm going to give you some evidence for that. So I hope you get fired up and maybe a little riled up. Some of you may disagree with what I'm saying. Some of you may agree. But please, please keep the conversation going and do talk about it. All right. So my agenda for today, um, basically, very briefly, I'm going to cover um, common representations of sex in your world. How comfortable are we individually and as a nation with human sexuality? How have historical forces structured and shaped our collective sense of sexual values, beliefs, behaviors, and identity? And how does biology affect sexual identity? Only you can answer the fifth question up there. All right, we're going to have a warm up here with Al and metaphorical pizza. And I'll bet right now you'd like the real thing, but too bad you don't get it. <laughs> I think you'll like Al, though. Ah. There we go. Turn off your microphone. 
like to talk to you today about a whole new way to think about sexual activity and sexuality education by comparison. If you talk to someone today in America about sexual activity, you'll find pretty soon you're not just talking about sexual activity, you're also talking about baseball. Because baseball is the dominant cultural metaphor that Americans use to think about and talk about sexual activity. And we know that because there's all this language in English that seems to be talking about baseball, but that's really talking about sexual activity. So for example, you could be a pitcher or a catcher, and that corresponds to whether you perform a sexual act or receive a sexual act. Of course, there are the bases, which refer to specific sexual activities that happen in a very specific order, ultimately resulting in a scoring a run or hitting a home run, which is usually having vaginal intercourse to the point of orgasm, at least for the guy. <laughs> you can strike out, which means you don't get to have any sexual activity. And if you're a bench warmer, you might be a virgin or somebody for whom whatever reason isn't in the game, maybe because of your age or because of your ability or because of your skill set. A bat's a penis and a nappy dugout is a vulva or a vagina. A glove or a catcher's mitt is a condom. A switch hitter is a bisexual person. And we gay and lesbian folks play for the other team. And then there's this one. If there's grass on the field, play ball. <laughs> and that usually refers to if a young person, specifically often a young woman, is old enough to have pubic hair, she's old enough to have sex with. This baseball model is incredibly problematic. It's sexist, it's heterosexist, it's competitive, it's goal-directed, and it can't result in healthy sexuality developing in young people or in adults. So we need a new model. I'm here today to offer you that new model, and it's based on pizza. Now, pizza is something that is universally understood and that most people associate with a positive experience. So let's do this. Let's take baseball and pizza and compare it when talking about three aspects of sexual activity. The trigger for sexual activity, what happens during sexual activity, and the expected outcome of sexual activity. So, when do you play baseball? You play baseball when it's baseball season and when there's a game on the schedule. It's not exactly your choice. So if it's prom night or a wedding night or at a party or if our parents aren't home, hey, it's just batter up. Can you imagine saying to your coach, uh, I'm not really feeling it today. I think I'll sit this game out. That's just not the way it happens. And when you get together to play baseball, immediately you're with two opposing teams. One playing offense, one playing defense. Somebody's trying to move deeper into the field. That's usually assigned to the boy. Somebody's trying to defend people moving into the field. That's often given to the girl. It's competitive. We're not playing with each other. We're playing against each other. And when you show up to play baseball, nobody needs to talk about what we're going to do or how this baseball game might be good for us. Everybody knows the rules. You just take your position and play the game. But when do you have pizza? Well, you have pizza when you're hungry for pizza. It starts with an internal sense, an internal desire, or a need. Huh, I could go for some pizza. <laughs> and because it's an internal desire, we actually have some sense of control over that. I can decide that I'm hungry, but know that it's not a great time to eat. And then when we get together with someone for pizza, we're not competing with them. We're looking for an experience that both of us will share that, that's satisfying for both of us. And when you get together for pizza with somebody, what's the first thing you do? You talk about it. You talk about what you want. You talk about what you like. You may even negotiate. How do you feel about pepperoni? <laughs> not so much. I'm kind of a mushroom guy myself. Well, maybe we can go half and half. And even if you've had pizza with somebody for a very long time, <laughs> don't you still say things like, should we get the usual? <laughs> or maybe something a little more adventurous. 
Okay, so when you're playing baseball, so if you talk about during sexual activity, when you're playing baseball, you're just supposed to round the bases in the proper order, one at a time. You can't hit the ball and run to right field. That doesn't work. And you also can't get to second base and say, I like it here. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> no. And also, of course, with baseball, there's like the specific equipment and a specific skill set. Not everybody can play baseball. It's pretty exclusive. Okay, but what about pizza? When we're trying to figure out what's good for pizza, isn't it all about what's our pleasure? There are a million different kinds of pizza. There's a million different toppings. There's a million different ways to eat pizza. And none of them are wrong. They're different. And in this case, difference is good because that's going to increase the chance that we're having a satisfying experience. And lastly, what's the expected outcome of baseball? Well, in baseball, you play to win. You score as many runs as you can. There's always a winner in baseball, and that means there's always a loser in baseball. But what about pizza? Well, in pizza, we're not really, there's no winning. How do you win pizza? You don't. But you do look for, are we satisfied? And sometimes that can be different amounts over different times or with different people or in different days. And we get to decide when we feel satisfied. If we're still hungry, we might have some more. If you eat too much, though, you just feel gross. <laughs> so what if we could take this pizza model and overlay it on top of sexuality education? A lot of sexuality education that happens today is so influenced by the baseball model, and it sets up education that can't help but produce unhealthy sexuality in young people and those young people become older people. But if we could create sexuality education that was more like pizza, we could create education that invites people to think about their own desires, to make deliberate decisions about what they want, to talk about it with their partners, and to ultimately look for not some external outcome, but for what feels satisfying. And we get to decide that. You may have noticed in the baseball and pizza uh, comparison, under the baseball, it's all commands. They're all exclamation points. But under the pizza model, they're questions. And who gets to answer those questions? You do. I do. So remember, when we're thinking about sexuality education and sexual activity, baseball, you're out. Pizza is the way to think about healthy, satisfying sexual activity and good comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry. So, um, Paul Joannides, who wrote the book, Guide to Getting It On, who, by the way, has signed this copy for whoever gets it, um, said that defining sex is kind of like trying to insert a diaphragm. Once you think you have it in, it turns all ninja on you. So for what I, I did for this presentation is I'm just saying that sex has anatomical, physiological, and behavioral components. And I'm, when I say sexuality, I'm talking about sex-related feelings, behaviors, relationships, attractions, and identity. So sex is fundamental to who we are, as Scott said. It's generally determined at conception, and we all know what precedes conception. Individual and collective experiences are both overtly and insidiously influenced by all kinds of social structures, our culture, our laws, socioeconomics, religion, all kinds of things. We're fairly unaware of the power and scope of those influences in our lives. Um, and in spite of, and as the result of these social structures, the human experience of sexuality actually ranges from divine ecstasy, truly, to annihilation, both literally and figuratively. So in your world, representations of sex in the media. As you look at this, you see that women are 
Sometimes their heads are missing or covered by magazines. Mouth is open. That's great. And, you know, guys selling salad dressing. <laughs> um, just objectified. And I would argue that this concept of of genders, of, of sexuality, influences the kind of monsters that we find on the left-hand side here. So I think we need to be very aware of what the media and what our culture is teaching us. While there are regional differences, without a doubt, overall, I would argue that sex-related knowledge and attitudes at best in this country are equivocal, at times paradoxical, and they're frequently just plain ignorant. I'm gonna give you some examples of this. These are from Marty Klein, who's been a sex therapist for a very, very long time. 60 million men, women, and couples regularly use porn, maybe just one or two of you out there, huh? Um, sale of sex toys, however, is banned in Alabama and parts of Georgia. Sex toys just are simply gadgets that make you feel good. Most in the U.S. say they support school sex education. However, most don't want schools teaching about pleasure, why people have sex, or how to decide to have sex. Nearly half of the six million yearly U.S. pregnancies are unintended but it's harder to get an abortion than to buy a semi-automatic weapon in most communities. So something to think about. Maybe you don't relate to the porn figure up there, although I suspect a lot of you do, and maybe you don't relate to the sex toys. You're missing out if you don't. <laughs> but in your world, what about sexting? So. It's really interesting. Um, just this month, a man named Jeremy Smith, who is a journalist, he's won a lot of awards and um, honors, summarized the latest research about sexting, and it really is a mixed bag, although you will generally hear all negative things about it from maybe older folks who are, are concerned about your welfare. They're not doing it to be mean. They, they are concerned about your welfare. But sexting can have a positive effect on relationships if all four of the listed components, and you just see two right now, but I'm going to go over all four of them, are met between a couple. So first of all, you have to have mutual and consensual and enthusiastic agreement about sexting together. A recent journal, um, or a recent study in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence found that 21% of approximately 900 college students, undergrads, largely women, that 21% were coerced into, se into sexting. And that really is a form of intimate partner abuse and is also a predictor of physical coercion. Those coerced did not feel confident enough, self-confident enough to say no. So get your confidence together, and if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Number two, emotional safety, respect, and open, honest, two-way communication. That means establishing what kind of sexting is okay and what kind of sexting is not okay between the two of you right up front. And I know a lot of times you think that is not a fun conversation to have. Well, you can make it a fun conversation. But without that conversation, the possibility of feeling extremely uncomfortable and a dissolution of the re relationship is very, very real. Attachment styles. Now, attachment styles are, you could do a whole postgraduate thing on attachment styles. Basically, it's a psychological theory, and it's based on how people relate to each other, often connected to their relationships in childhood. So if you have um, common relationship or a f um, ability to attach styles, then you can agree on certain elements of texting that can actually enhance a relationship. So um, if both of you are very comfortable being close, 
and your, your sex are very open and close, that can work for your relationship. If both of you need some distance in the relationship, sexting can be a great way to avoid the hands-on stuff, but still get really excited about things. It's when you have a person who's open and a person who's closed trying to match, then you can have some real problems. And just know that creative honesty is really, really important. And creative means that most people agree sexting is basically fantasy and that there is deception involved and it needs to be knowing deception. So, few people are honest about what they're wearing, what they're doing, or what they intend to do. And as long as you know that up front, it can be a good thing for a relationship. It can be exciting stuff. Ultimately, texting can be playful, imaginative, and fun if everyone is knowingly and voluntarily participating in the fantasy. If not, it really can be destructive. And from the mouth of a former owner of the largest adult modeling agency in the world who used to live here in Roner Park, believe it or not, once you send an image, there is no way you can be assured that that image will be destroyed. So, just saying, keep that in your head. <laughs> so what about here at SSU? Um, often, I think on, in California, we're seen as more open, more liberal than, say, maybe Kansas or Indiana. So what have been your experiences in your family life, in your home life, regarding um, talking openly and honestly about sexuality with your parents? So. By the way, I wanted to say the Nursing 480 um, Human Sexuality class is still alive, it's still kicking, it's still great. There are two other people who have taken it over, so look for that course. You can't take it till you're a junior or senior, but it's a really good course. All right. So what um, I used to do in that course was every, well first, students had to, um, all students had to do a fairly explicit sex presentation in front of the class. And I did that because I want people to get comfortable talking about sexuality so they can talk to their kids about it. Um, and you're gonna see why I did that in just a little bit from some of these results. So first of all, this is a quote from a last semester senior at um, Sonoma State in the Nursing 480 class. All students are required to present, as I said, and she said, these last few weeks have been the first time my parents have hesitantly discussed sexuality with me. I practiced my part of the group presentation in front of them, and while my father was especially awkward at first, it really opened a door for discussion that was previously closed. I think it's a shame that they felt so awkward about it in the past because I could have used their insight growing up. When you have kids, remember that. Okay, so every week um, there were anonymous surveys, and this is just a little piece of one week of a survey, and I would analyze those surveys and present, present the results back to the class. So, how old were you when you first learned about sexual intercourse? And as you can say, most, most people were between 10 and 12, six to nine came in second, but more knew about it at the age of five or less than at 15 or 16. So maybe we need to be teaching human sexuality a little earlier, and maybe if parents introduced it as soon as the questions started coming in a normal, natural way, we wouldn't have these kinds of um, problems happening that we see in the world today. <laughs> From whom or what did you first hear about sexual intercourse? You can see Friends number one, it's a little scary. Movies number two, that's even scarier, especially when you consider the porn stats. School personnel were number three. Parents were number four. Less than half as many parents were the first people to talk to their, their students about it as um, friends. Marty Klein, um, again, sex therapist, said, because porn is so ubiquitous, kids, and you know as um, former kids that you're really resourceful. You can get into a lot of your parents' stuff and they don't know it. 
He says the parents need to have an intelligent, caring conversation with their students, or with their, with their um, children, that communicate, number one, porn is an adult prod product, and behaviors included in porn can make children very confused. Number two, it's not a documentary. It's not a real portrayal of sex. Rather, it's by actors playing characters that were made up by somebody else. And number three, the bodies in porn are not typical. Just like models, movie studios choose the people in porn because of their unusual physical characteristics. All right, how factually correct was the first info you had about um, sexual intercourse? The majority of people said they had partially accurate information. And although small, at least accurate was a little bit higher than very inaccurate. When you first learned about sexual intercourse, how did you feel about it? Curious and a little awkward were the, the big winners there. Weird came in third, and um, that might reflect maybe the, the partially accurate information that people had. Um, by the way, generally when this was asked, this was, these are all glommed together, both males and females, about 300, um, mostly seniors, some junior students here. Women tended to be more in the upper area, men tended to be more, more fall into more the lower area of those descriptors. So why is it so hard to talk about? It's how we all got here. We're sexual beings from the time of conception. Sex hormones constantly influence our anatomy, physiology, cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. And for most of us, sex is an innately powerful source of pleasure and expression of love. Yet sometimes hiding our sexual identities is really prudent for social acceptance and for safety. When it comes to sexual activity, normal is probably way broader than any of you think. If what turns you on is risk aware, consensual, and non-exploitive, it's probably okay. So, we've had some recent changes in laws. We now have same-sex marriage as legal. Transgender rights have been, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much um, accepted, maybe not in North Carolina bathrooms, but a lot of other places. So what do you guys think? Do you think that we've had this nice, slow, maybe not nice, but this slow build of information about human sexuality, or do you think the course in throughout history has been a little bit more circuitous? What do you think? Don't know. Okay, we're gonna take a look at some of those things. And before we do that, um, just globally, this is grossly oversimplified, but there are two basic views of human sexuality, or I, philosophies, I guess you could say, of human sexuality. The metaphysical pessimism view. Um, sexual desire always objectifies the other person, thus is inherently degrading. Enjoying sex leads to a loss of self-control, therefore it should never be enjoyed. And number three, sex is sanctioned only in heterosexual marriage and only for procreation. It must be rigorously constrained. These are really interesting thoughts, particularly right now as um, overpopulation really does seem to be threatening our survival um, on this planet. And sex is predominantly practiced now for pleasure versus procreation. Then we have the metaphysical sexual optimism, a point of view that sex is powerful, but it achieves its meaning in context. Sex is pleasurable, and it is conducive to our well-being. The nature of sexual activity can be deeply and mutually bonding and spiritual. So think about the influences of both of these, these um, views of sexuality on person, your personal identity and your human development. So I'm gonna start way back with some biblical things and we're gonna move really fast through history. And I admit that I have pulled out the things that I think 
will boost my argument for open talk about human sexuality. And um, if you have great differences about some of the things I've said here, please talk about them in your classes. So sexuality, human sexuality, seems to be sanctioned in Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I'm not sure what the re in that means, but um, were, there, was there, were there civilizations here before us? I don't know. And from the Song of Psalms, Song of um, Solomon or Song of Songs, the bridegroom, as you read that, there's a sense of ecstasy, sexual ecstasy in that, and along with the bride who says, I am my beloved's, his desires towards me. Come, let's go forth into the fields. Let us lodge in the villages, and there I will give you my love. On the other hand, we have Paul of Tarsus, who um, really emphasized the importance of overcoming any desire of the flesh. And the, he associated spirituality with celibacy and being unmarried. Bishop Augustine said lust was the original sin of Adam and Eve, and only males should be on top because they were dominant. And I think that's probably where we got the idea of missionary position. Not sure, but I think so. So I grew up in the Midwest, and I went to Sunday school every single Sunday, both Sunday school and church, for 18 years. And I thought the word lust meant the most horrible, incredibly awful thing an, an individual could do. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I actually looked up the word. And it means a pleasure, a delight, and a desire to gratify the senses. So a walk in the park could be lustful. Um, watching birds play in your yard could be lustful. Eating a great piece of cheesecake could be lustful. So lust isn't necessarily a really negative thing. In fact, for most of it, it's a positive thing. All right, the Middle Ages. Sex for anything other than procreation was a crime against nature. And yet, we seem to have that natural inclination <laughs> for sexual activity. There was great concern about men secretly in league with the devil to impregnate barnyard animals. Not sure where that came from. The age of consent was 10 years old. There was a strong virgin whore dichotomy, which I would argue is very much alive and well today. Um, the Virgin Mary as the pure, sexually um, uninterested female, and Eve, the evil temp temptress and whore. And there were witch hunts for approximately 200 years looking for women who enjoyed carnal lust or who were having orgies with the devil. Estimated 50,000 women put to death as a result of this. Withdrawal to avoid pregnancy um, required a penance of bread and water for years, but it wasn't quite as bad, I guess, as um, having carnal lust because there was no death involved, although bread and water for years doesn't sound like much fun. All right, enlightenment. Through the 16th to 18th century, Martin Luther and John Calvin modified views somewhat, and um, there was an advent of scientific rationalism. So in addition to reproduction, marital sex was condoned to lighten and ease the cares and sadnesses of household affairs, or to endear each other. And this I found really interesting. A Puritan man, Puritan, we tend to think of Puritans as not involved with sex at all, but a Puritan man was expelled from Boston because he denied conjugal fellowship unto his wife for the space of two years. All right, moving forward, Mary Wollstonecraft, who is one of my heroes, wrote The Vindication of Women's Rights in 1792. She attacked limits placed on females, particularly with respect to education. She asserted that sexual satisfaction was every bit as important to women as it was to men. Imagine that. Marital and extramarital sex were not sinful. And she had a famous daughter who wrote a book that I bet a lot of you are familiar with. Does anybody know who that is? 
who her daughter was, what the book was. Her daughter was Mary Shelley. What did Mary Shelley write? Yeah, good, Frankenstein. All right, then we move into the Victorian era, which was a kind of a step backward again. Women were seen as fragile. They were constrained by rules, corsets, bustles, and hoops. And take a look at what those corsets did to women's internal organs. William Acton, a physician, said the majority of women are not very much troubled with sexual feelings of any kind. Perhaps that was because they were all burnt in the Middle Ages, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, sexual and emotional distance was encouraged between husband and wife. Husbands could smoke, drink, and joke. Wives were supposed to be virtuous and have absolutely no in interest in sex at all. So, of course, prostitution flourished and it was actually encouraged for men, so they didn't pollute their wives. But those of you who think men had it easy, Enter masturbation panic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, this was aimed at men only, or pretty much only, because of course women didn't have these kinds of feelings. So John Harvey Kellogg of Corn Flakes and Sylvester Graham of Crackers reported that 40 ounces of blood were lost with each male ejaculation. <laughs> so Kellogg ran the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and Graham was a minister. This solitary vice of self-pollution caused urinary disease, nocturnal emissions, impotence, cholera, plague, insanity, feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, and ultimately death. Such a victim dies literally by his own hands. Dr. Adam Clark noted, neither the plague, nor war, nor smallpox, nor similar diseases have produced results so disastrous to humanity as the pernicious habit of onanism. <laughs> so sex only for conception and no more than once a month was what was um, preached at the time. And we now know that frequent ejaculations over the course of a lifetime actually decrease the risks of prostate cancer. I've spared you these um, pictures of the anti-masturbation devices, but if you haven't seen those, you can Google them um, and think slasher movie as you Google them. It was pretty, it was pretty brutal. The picture at the bottom, um, it's, this is what the small print says, representing the last stage of mental and bodily exhaustion from self-pollution. You can see. Pale, spent, no blood left. All right, then we have Anthony Comstock. Anthony was the head of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. He wrote the Comstock Act. This was called an act for the suppression of trade in and circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use. Largely, he was referring to literature about birth control and birth control devices. He criminalized premarital sex, and we think we have crowded prisons now. Uh, European influences, however, were going on at the same time. Freud said that the sex drive is a fundamental force in a person's psychology, and that abstinence was unnatural and harmful. Freud was a mixed bag, and we have disputed a lot of the things he came up with, but this one seems to hold pretty true. Reich, also um, from Germany, said that orgasms can cure neuroses. And he talked about genital stagnation and how that led to emotional and physical problems. Um, you can imagine, actually, they developed all kinds of gadgets and treatments. And you can just kind of imagine what those must have been like for to treat problems with genital stagnation. OK, I know you can't read that. I know it's little tiny print. I'm going to send this PowerPoint to Scott, who can give it to different instructors in the room. Um, these are all of the positive benefits, psychological and physiological, for um, <coughs> masturbation and orgasms. Actually, it's not all of them, but it's a pretty darn good list. So another hero of mine, Margaret Sanger. This woman was formidable. She was really something. 
Um, her mother's history really deeply affected her, as well as her work with women in the Lower East Side of New York, New York, poor immigrant women. And as the result of a lack of birth control, the death rates were very, very high. Poverty was really, really high. She became really militant and defiant. She went to France, brought back condoms, was arrested, was thrown in jail on multiple occasions, and did spend about 30 days in jail. She was committed to finding a cheap, effective method of birth control for women, a cheap pill, and she actually was able to do that with the help of a male physician. And she um, developed in 1944 what later would become known as Planned Parenthood. Okay, so while I'm talking about Planned Parenthood, I'm including the next slide not as a scare tactic for you, but because I want you to control your own sexual health and be empowered to do that. And these are things I think you need to know to do it. I'm not going to go into detail, but you'll get the picture. Okay, these are from the CDC, um, 2016. The rates don't change much from year to year. Adolescents and young adults acquire half of all new STD cases per year. 50% of STDs are in the age range of 15 to 24 years of age. And one in four sexually active adolescent females has an STD. Why? Why is that the way it is? Very good reasons. Number one, biological reasons. Um, there are certain kinds of cervical cells that are more vulnerable to STDs in this age group for young women. The most important one, however, is our behavioral and cultural, <laughs> our behavioral and cultural neglect, I think, is, is what it is when it comes to educating our um, young people about um, human sexuality. So there are multiple barriers to quality STD prevention and management, an inability to pay in young people, a lack of transportation, long wait lines, inaccessible clinical hours due to work or school. Embarrassment, the method of the specimen collection, which, you know, that first GYN exam is, is an eye-opener. It's, it's pretty interesting. And concerns about confidentiality. So the major reason we have these high STI rates or STD rates in young people it's because of guilt and embarrassment, because people can't talk about it. They don't feel they can openly inform, they don't feel they can openly request, and they don't openly get the treatment that is needed. So I rest my case right there, but I'm gonna go on. All right, there is some good news. Your generation is way, way, way better at using condoms than my generation. And guess what, my generation, which is really old now, we have some problems with STDs, <laughs> some big ones, because for some reason people think when they reach a certain age they can't get them anymore, but they can. All right. So, late 1800s to the 1940s. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, my gosh. All right. I'm going to have to just click through some of these really quickly. The suffrage movement, I, I don't know if you knew, but women weren't allowed to vote, women weren't allowed to attend universities, and they were considered property, and because of the suffrage movement, they actually could own property <laughs> after that. Um, World War I and II, women moved out into the workforce, got jobs, men were exposed to more open sexual um, mores in Europe and came back with those. Um, penicillin, 1948, penicillin became mass produced, so it could treat STIs. In the small print there, it says syphilis, all of these men have it, and in the small print it says women stay away from dance halls. <laughs> so, 40s and 50s, time of great repression, but it was also the breeding ground for really great change that occurred in the 60s. Um, women who wanted to continue their careers were labeled as having penis envy or neurotic, and men could actually lock away their wives if they got tired of them in mental institutions for so-called hysteria. 
Christina Jorgensen had the first widely publicized male to female sex change. Kinsey, um, who was really quite incredible, published things for which he was labeled a communist, a pervert, a subversive by all kinds of people. 60s and 70s, the sexual revolution occurred. It was an exciting time to be alive. Um, multiple forms of birth control became legal within marriage and then a little bit later outside of marriage as well. You know about the free love movement, I'm sure. American Psychiatric um, Association finally removed um, same sex as a mental disorder. Um, the Stonewall riots occurred and California became the first state to um, acknowledge that rape could occur within marriage. 80s to 2016, oh, oh I'm so okay. Um, basically, we still have a long way to go. I'm gonna skip the um, biological sex um, <coughs> slide, but I do want you to take a look at it. You know, our sexual identities and our sexual orientations are pretty much predetermined at the time of birth. So it's not like it's a decision that can just be switched off or changed, and there isn't any um, form of therapy that can change that as well. Dr. John Money, um, I hope you take a look at this. It's really important in terms of learning to identify what your assumptions are and to find evidence for what you believe is the truth. So how many of you think human sexuality is more varied than in animal species? Um, raise your hand, hi, hi. How many of you don't know? Most, okay, all right. So a 2009 meta-analysis of species sexual activity found that same sex sex is pretty much universal across all species. Albatross, um, a scientist found that fully one-third of nests were populated with both um, with two females, one would escape just long enough to get fertilized and then come back to the nest. Clownfish, when the female um, of, in a pair of clownfish dies, no, when the male in a pair of clownfish dies, no, when a female in the pair of clownfish dies, the male turns into a female. And dolphins actually mount each other, male dolphins and adolescents, to develop, a, it's a bonding exercise, so they can mate with the females a little bit later on, um, working together in that process. However, male dung flies actually mount each other to wear each other out, to wear out the competitors for the female. Um, if you don't know about porcupines, look it up, it's a good one. And bonobos, <laughs> bonobos, bonobos are amazing. They greet each other with ma uh, mutual masturbation and um, you know, we might be able to solve some of the problems in the world if we, well, probably not. <laughs> it would have to be mutual. Okay, sex spectrums. <laughs> Way too much stuff here. All right, I'm just gonna, because it's about five till, I'm gonna jump to this. This was written by a student in the 480 class about learning about human sexuality. Man, it was a wild ride, but it all sorts out in the end after so much awkward confusion, pain, pleasure, and fear. It's everyone's personal process, and on their own terms, they will find their way. And my message to you, your personal sexual evolution doesn't have to stop at graduation or ever, if that's what you want. With a good dose of personal responsibility, sustained desire, health and deep connection with self and others, sex can be an increasingly profound, indescribable, unimaginable, lifelong source of pleasure, well-being, and meaning. Learning about sex and intimacy truly is a lifelong task, and I am not kidding about that. So I hope all of you have wonderful, fulfilling sex life, if that's what you want.